Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Okay. He was a wee boy at heart now. And now he is a mom with everything. The Lord has really looked after him. He definitely has blessed with the word. sinned and come short of the glory of God. Did you hear me? Don't measure sin by a foot rule. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. People that I talk to, you know, the, the, the scene when the pastors preached, uh, one lady, uh, in fact, one lady, she said she was in the gallery and while he was preaching, uh, she saw a, a mist around him. If you're serving the devil, you have no future. If you're living in sin, there's no future. But if you come to Christ, he'll put your past behind you. Not only will he put your past behind you, he will blot it out. And all you've got left is a future. There was an age of ministry attached to him. In fact, some people have been known to say that actually saw the angel walking behind him and walking around him. Let's stand to our feet and sing a 329 right then, everyone. Come on. Uh, He certainly sees himself as being a class apart, and in many ways he is a class apart. Our nation's wrecked. Our needs need to come back to God again. And I believe that Jim McCall and men like him are going to be thrust onto the stage of life to minister the gospel to them. There's always somebody in that lane who's always special. Out of the flock, he raises somebody special up. A Moses, a Joshua. There's always somebody. And I believe that Jim McConnell is raised for his day in this generation. This church began 40 years ago, in the year 1957, in the month of February. <laughs> I remembered it so well. It was a snowy day, and we had booked the Orange Hall. We had a brush of butts up in the matches, dispensed the smell of the drink from the Saturday night previously. We got brushes and cloths, and we cleaned it out and had it ready for the people coming. We could do there with about 15 people, 10 to 15 people, but there were some strangers coming up more and made it look something. And we had a lovely break of the bread, a lovely time with Christ to start off. That night, 60, 62 people showed up, and one lady came to Christ who lived in Rathcool. During the service, there was a ministry of prophecy come through. And uh, if anyone outside had a hair, it have been sent for the wee men to wait coats. I think we were mad. But the voice of God spoke and said that this small people would be enlarged and it'd be a great multitude, but build, build bigger churches for the, to hold the people. And that's what actually happened. If you look at someone who started off with 10 people and look at what he has today, you have got to ask yourself the question, what happened in between? And us from How did 10 become three and a half thousand? 
To me, one of the secrets of the man is that he has something to say. And early on in the Troubles, the early 70s, when people wanted to hear more than what they were hearing and what they were reading in their papers, uh, they had a heart that was broken. There were heavy hearts. And they come to Whitewell and they heard a preacher. You'll never catch a fish if you try to clean it. You catch it first and then you clean it. And you know, when God caught some of the fish that's sitting behind me tonight and I'm looking at them, he not only cleaned them, he gutted them. <laughs> he gutted them. He really, he had to gut us. Right from the throat, right down to the very tail. He gutted us and he cleaned us out. And then he salted us with the salt of his goodness. And tonight we're shining for him. I was born in East Belfast in 1937 in 14 Spring Street on the Woodstock Road. It was an exciting childhood. I enjoyed it. I had plenty of chums about the street. We were always doing things very active. The big money spinner in the MTS was Garen Skins. <laughs> <laughs> and Sparky, he was in the middle of it. Well, everybody was, they'd all nicknames in the empty. Sparky McCollum, he was in the middle of it. I didn't do so well at school. And, uh, and I got my eye focused on professional football. And uh, I used to, as soon as school was over, went to Ormo Park <laughs> with a few other players who then played for Glen Turn and for Linfield and for Arts. Oh, Sparky's a great footballer. He loved to kick a ball about, and mind you, whenever he come on you to tackle you, knew Sparky was on you. I think he could still kick a ball, but I don't think he could run after it. Like <laughs> My father had a good job in the shipyard as a driller and earned lots of money, but then with him taking ill, things were very poor indeed. And my grandparents, brought me up and looked after me and fed me and and whatever help that they could get they got and, and reared me. You were sent to Sunday school, it was a thing, that was a must. That was a part of your life. Even in ungodly houses, as we were saying, That's right. they were, they so were they, sent. You, you, the people, most of them had been having their smoking or drinking, but you were still sent to Sunday school. You know, you were still, that was part of your week. I began to go to the Iron Hall Sunday School and a precious man there, his name was Sammy Jemison, had a tremendous impression in my life. The end of April 1944, and I can remember it very well. It was just an ordinary class, uh, just an ordinary Sunday as far as that goes. Um, but he was there. And uh, when, when the rest of the boys got up and went, he got up and went along with them. But he came back in again, and he just came over to me and he said, Mr. Jamison, I would love to come to Jesus. And he was delighted. I never saw anybody so thrilled and so pleased. Uh, you know, a, a boy of seven <clears throat> asking today to come to Christ. Other people would dismiss him and say, this is a little boy's notion, you know. When I was convinced of myself that he was, wasn't back for fun, he was really genuine in what he wanted, then the custom of the church was that uh, you got down and pray with these boys. And that was the start of God, the Holy Spirit, moving in my young life. <laughs>
they used to do. They used to go and say, we're meeting such and such a street, we're going to such and such a street, and they'd all come out of the church and be there, but they didn't happen to tell them where they were going. They just said, we'll go up here, and then we'll go up past Well Street. And, of course, the big the haircut with the, the Apache saying, the big, somebody hit him a hatchet down the middle shade. Uh, where are you going? Oh, we're having it here tonight. Where? Right here. Where? Outside your door. I says, you're joking. We're having an open air outside 14 Spring Street. Well, look, if I wish the ground could open up and swallow me, I wanted that to happen to me. And then I had been going to all the open airs. I couldn't get out of this one. And they were all sitting, waiting in Hamble. The older ones had suits and all them days, you know, want some money. Such a yarn. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it was... Just an experience for him, because I think he tried, I think everybody tried, and they're all sitting waiting to tell us about it. Well, there was a dozen of my mates, <laughs> and they were making all sorts of signs at me, and they were laughing at me, and I remember doing this with my fist, you, you know, <laughs> shaking it at them, and the time came for me to give my testimony, and I stepped into the ring. Well, he didn't shame himself. I would say he didn't shame himself. He left in no doubt in people's mind who he loved and where his main, his main drag was going, and that was to Calvary with the Lord. And that was the breaking of the ice. And from that day, I never stopped talking about Christ. And that was the night that I knew that God had called me to the ministry and called me into his work. And the old rugged cross made the difference in a life of providing and defeating. I will praise him forever and ever. When I entered the ministry <coughs> full time at two months of my 18th birthday, I went to a place called Gateshead, you know, Newcastle in time. And I began to do pulpit supply for a pastor that had went to the United States. People over there found him different. People flocked to hear him. There were signs and wonders and miracles and a great freedom of ministry in the young man. He was an evangelist at heart. I was still a boy. Can you imagine a fellow with big ears sticking out and brill cream on his head and a middle shade <coughs> and a wee suit who just loved everybody? <laughs> and I think, I don't think it was my preaching that drew them first. I think it was pity that drew a lot of them. People found that there was a, a, a spirit with them which was different to all the preachers they'd heard. And inside six months, 500 people had come to Christ. There was a tremendous move of God in that little church. Pastor McConnell, do you not realize you told a lie? Yes, you did. Mm -hmm. But God overlooked it. Because this was a woman who didn't know about salvation. She didn't know about... You've life. asked me, but you saw the what do you think this guy was doing wrong that I had such success in Newcastle? <laughs> I don't think he was doing anything wrong, but I remember this vividly. <laughs> The little landlady that I was staying with, Mrs. Carr, in Dean Street, he, he came back and he said to her, where's this revival that we've heard about? Because when he came to preach that Sunday, 50 people turned out. And the old lady put it this way, and it's laughable, she says, the revival went home to Belfast. God hath commanded a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he hath ordained, and whom he hath given assurance, and that he hath raised him from the dead. When UDA started, I was one of the founder members, probably in East Belfast. I was in the organization for 20 years. I was in prison twice, and I um, was on the inner council of the UDA for 10 years, from 1980 until 1990. And on January 1991, 
I went to my colleagues in the UDA and told them I was going to leave. And I left for personal reasons that I had felt 20 years was enough, that I needed to do something else with my life. I was in a club last night and I was really pie-eyed, really out of my mind. And a certain gentleman whose name is Norman Stobo, and he says, uh, Sammy says, what about going up to Whitewell some night for their holding a the gospel rally up on it? Hey, Norman, and he says to him, I want to go up and see Sparky McCollum. Hey, because I want to thank him. He's a boyhood friend. I love him, and I, want, I miss him, and I want to go and see him. One night, Sunday night, about nine months after I'd left the organization, an old friend came along, a guy that I'd last seen about 15 years previous, in Long Cash, and he said to me, Billy, would you like to go up to Whitewell Church? I said, yes, I would. I would like to go up. And I remember as I went into the church that there was all these people and they seemed so happy and they were singing. And I remember just standing, I didn't know the words, but I was certainly listening to it and I could sense the love within the church. When I first heard Jim McConnell, my first impression was, here is a man who is in love with Jesus Christ. He's in love with a person. And it was his love for Christ that gripped me. Because he preached as if he had met him. He had preached as if he had knew him, as if he had been with him. And that just grabbed me. The old time preacher was maybe slower, I think, but Jim got excited about it, you know, to tell you anything. He really got into it. You could see the expressions as well as its actions. You can see it even today when, he, when he's preaching. It doesn't matter who he is or what she is. Be they Protestant, be they Catholic, Pervert, murderer, drunkard, extortioner, adulterer, fornicator, liar, con man, prostitute, religious. If they come crying for mercy, crying for cleansing, God will wash them in the blood of his son. I think he's a great orator. He's very gripping. And uh, you don't miss a word. Um, and he's got, all, he's got all the techniques for that, I think. He, um, there, there's the emotion. There's the storytelling, which is very, again, gripping. He will uh, bring stories out and lead them along. Um, he shouts. He, um, uh, and shouts sometimes, actually, and this is what we was talking about, he shouts in the evangelical way, but maybe not sometimes, I think, at the most serious points. He will use those verses, lonely verses, and he will do a lot of pointing. You need a sinless mediator. There is only one person who can fit that bill. And that person is God's impeccable Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my surety. He is my surety. It's Him that I am totally and utterly depending upon. Whitewell may be looked upon as uh, Jim McConnell's Metropolitan Church. But Jim McConnell would very distinctly say, it's God's work. It's Missionary Sunday today, so we're asking you to give generously for the work of the Lord. I think the scene is set for any preacher to fill his pockets. And that preacher is answerable to his congregation. He's not a rich man. He lives a very modest lifestyle. Leslie Hill did bring a lot of suspicion into the minds of many people because Leslie had promised to build this, that and the other and nothing ever happened. Why we can't compare Jim McConnell to anyone like this is simply the fact Jim has delivered the goods. He said he would build, and he's built. He said he would fill the auditorium, and he filled it. And if he says that he has heard from God, and has had a visitation from an angelic being, as I know he is, has encountered, you've got to believe it. This September afternoon, 
I was seeking God as usual. <clears throat> and I was up in the balcony of the church. And a messenger came to see me. I believe that messenger could have been an angel from the Lord. He didn't wrap the door. He was there. And he spoke to me about the future of this great house. Anything that has happened here that has not been by chance. And he told me what I needed to do. And when he left that day, I was different. I was changed inside out. And it was indicated to me that day that souls would be saved in that church every week. And that was 1973. And without fail, souls has been saved in this church every week. Is there a man in this house tonight? Is there a woman in this house? Is there a young man? Is there a young woman? Is there a boy? Is there a girl who will say, Pastor McConnell, I need mercy. Pastor McConnell, I need God's grace. Pastor McConnell, I need saved. Thank you, lady. I already see your hand. Is there another one? Thank you, sir. Right over there, I see your hand. And another lady down there, I see your hand. Is there another one? There's a lady right up there, I see your hand. May God bless you. Is there someone else tonight? I actually put my you hand up yes, on Pastor Sunday McConnell night in Whitewell. Well, that night there was nine saved. And I was the third one to put up my hand. And I knew that if I didn't do it then, I would never do it. Is there another one tonight? Where are you, friend? Where are you? Is there another? How many is that, Pastor? Six people have responded. Is there another one tonight? When the pastor put up the appeal that night, I knew that I needed saved. And I cried out to God for mercy in the name of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember, I will never forget the feeling of relief. It was like waves of peace coming over me, and it was tremendous. Is there one more? Oh, sir, don't go out of here without Christ. Is there one more? Would you quickly and quietly lift that hand? He just left me a no doubt that where I'd be going, if I didn't change my ways. Well, I come down the aisle and I just say, Sparty, will you point me to the Lord? Well, he cried and I cried and... Thirteen people have responded. What does God's people say? <laughs> We're waiting on you, sir. We're waiting on you, lady. This is the final call. And you know what may be the final call in your life? You could go out there tonight and go out into eternity without God and without Christ and without hope in the world. Those spies said, Rahab, you must stay in this house. If you go outside the house, then we cannot guarantee your safety. You must stay in this house. This house where the scarlet cord is, this house which has the symbol of the precious blood, you must stay in it. That's the believer's security tonight. While he stays under the blood, he's safe. <laughs> Is there another one tonight? I knew some of my students one night were saying they wanted to put their hand up just to get out because it's, oh, one more hand, one more hand. And that seems to be a sales pitch or some kind of success rate rather than it is bringing people into a relationship with God. I feel personally that's putting the Holy Spirit in the duel. I don't convert anybody as a preacher. And James McConnell doesn't convert anybody as a preacher. But in the way that he is the hand thing, he almost is there to be the person to say, you've made a decision. It's what the old preachers used to say many years ago. He preaches for a verdict. And that's what I'm doing, preaching for a verdict. I know other preachers preach the word. <coughs> Preach it as zealously and better than I do. But they just leave it with people. But that's their way. That's their method. Pastor McConnell's very much into the now. And of course it says today is the day of salvation. But are we saying then that I've got to get them into the kingdom? Or are we saying that the Holy Spirit's bigger than us? And that the Holy Spirit can do a work that we can't do? Jesus never... You know, Jesus told stories and walked away. The pastor was saying, you know, this is your night to decide. That if you don't decide... God may be finished with you, with, you know, striving with you. Some nights, it's tremendous. The response is wonderful. And it inspires me. I get thrilled. And any gospel preacher will tell you when he sees men and women coming to Christ, he gets so thrilled. He, he, he would just keep asking and keep asking. 
Is there another one tonight who'll say, yes, pastor, I need Christ. I want Christ. Thank you, lady. Thank you. And another lady down at the back. I see your hand. There's another lady right over there. I see your hand. Evangelicals are usually out of a Protestant Reformed tradition. And the Reformation was all about disagreeing with an infallible Pope. But these people who are criticizing the Pope for being infallible get up on a Sunday morning in their pulpits and become a Pope because they're infallible. And I think that is a Northern Ireland thing. I think the no surrender thing that we've got goes into every area of life, from the football team you support, to the politics that you have, to this theology. The evangelical tradition <coughs> has been uh, characterized by its critics, I would say, as intolerant. But we're not intolerant. The evangelical tradition preaches from the scriptures. And if the scriptures say that there is a Lamb's book of life, and Revelation chapter 13 says that this book was written from before the foundation of the world. And whoever's name was not written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that's what the Bible says. That's not what we say. That's what the Bible says. You know, if your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life before he preaches a sermon, why does he need people to put their hand up at the end of it? We have to say what the Bible says. And so if we say what the Bible says, and if we appear intolerant, then we're intolerant. But the one that we serve, he got up and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. blood of the Lamb. And as long as this church exists, and we have existed for 40 years, we will still believe in the power of the blood.